Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today to reconnect with Tony Khan, who is here with us to discuss the upcoming WrestleDream pay-per-view event in Seattle on Sunday and a host full of shows leading into WrestleDream as well. So just uh, as normal, our, our, our housekeeping uh, items here to address in the interest of time and to give everyone a, you know, the best opportunities possible to ask a question, please refrain from asking two-party questions. And let's try to keep the questions focused on the upcoming shows this week. And as Robin mentioned, please make sure your phone is unmuted. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tony for some opening thoughts, and then we'll open the lines for your questions. Tony. Well, Jim, thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone joining us today. I'm really excited. This Sunday is going to be one of the great nights in pro wrestling. I really believe it's going to be a great event. I'm excited about Wrestle Dream. Uh, very excited to uh, honor the legacy of the late great Antonio Inoki. Uh, very excited to announce that his family is really thrilled about the event, and they're going to be coming to Seattle to participate, which I think is just so great. It's going to be one of the best cards we've ever put together. It's going to be a great pay-per-view. It will be the end of a chapter in AEW and the start of a new era of AEW. I'm very excited for that. And uh, with that, we can get going with your questions. I know Jim said to refrain from two-part questions, but he never said anything about three-part or four-part questions, so I guess those are probably okay. Uh, Jim, take it away. All right, Tony. Well, I can't. I have no comeback to that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, let, let's give it our best, uh, starting with John Alba from Fight, and then we're going to follow John with Steve Fall from 10 Count. John, you're first. Hey, Tony. I'm just glad to get my question in before Bill Pritchard, because Bill always has the secret sauce for getting quality Tony Khan answers. Uh, but I hope you're well, Tony. Thank you, Jim. Uh, this morning, there's a big announcement from WWE about Jade Cargill coming in. And we know that for a long time, Jade was a major project in AEW and had one of the longest title reigns that your company may ever see, quite frankly. I would love to have your honest thoughts on Jade moving on to WWE and how you feel you guys in presentation of her. Uh, I have only positive things to say about Jade. It's been great having her in AEW. Uh, she's always welcome here. I think uh, she's had a great run with us and uh, has a great career, I'm sure, in front of her. Uh, you know, we're wishing her the best in the future. Thanks. Okay, John, thank you very much. Steve Fall from 10 Count, you are next. And we're going to follow Steve with Stu Myrick from Sports Guys Talking Wrestling. Steve. Hey, Tony. Thanks for taking the call. Quick question, though. It seems like every month we're getting another AEW pay-per-view, and everyone wants to know if we're going to see AEW on a streaming platform soon. Can we talk about monthly pay-per-views, and will they land on a streaming platform very soon? I am... Really excited about Russell Dream. We built a great calendar of events. I think there's more events we can add. I've never said that I expect to go to pay per views every single month, but we've been doing several events. You know, we came into this year with five great events uh, that we had run in 2022 in Revolution, Double or Nothing, Forbidden Door, All Out, and Full Gear. And then this year, uh, we've got all those great events, and we've added huge shows obviously all in is the biggest event we've ever done on top of our traditional calendar so it proves i think that there's room to grow our schedule and now we're adding wrestle dream and the excitement about wrestle dream really makes me happy i was just so pumped to see how much the online wrestling community really has embraced the show and particularly uh in the last week the card is really strong uh we had a great episode of collision this past saturday to follow up a great grand slam it feels like we're on the best run of major events we've ever done, which is why it's a great time to look at adding major events like this great Wrestle Dream show. If there was ever a time to add an event like this, where the card has built massive anticipation, people are really excited about the theme of the event, and I think we're doing it for a really good reason. And uh, it's following up on the best run of major events we've ever done. I really believe the last three pay-per-views, uh, Wrestle, uh, Wrestle, excuse me, the last three pay-per-views we've done, Forbidden Door, uh, followed by All In and All Out. I think this is the best run of three pay-per-views we've ever done. Then Grand Slam is one of our top events of the year. That was a huge success. Um, I'm sure pretty much, hopefully, all of you on the call received 
the press release from Warner Brothers Discovery. If you didn't, let us know, and we'll try to get you on the, the chain for those going forward. But Warner Brothers Discovery sent out a great press release last night touting the success of AEW Dynamite Grand Slam, which was the biggest broadcast of the year. And really, really great thing there. And that's another big major event. And just feels like we're on a great run, so it's a great time to add events. And in this case, in the form of pay-per-views. I am very open to uh, putting AEW events on a streaming platform. I think it would be a great thing. I think we're, frankly, close enough to the end of our media obligations here uh, and our uh, our current deal where it would that sounds like a new deal to me. And it's the kind of thing that would be uh, that would be part of uh, a new media rights package, and that would be great for us. So it's something I would really like to do. Um, it's outside the scope of our current contract, uh, which is, you know, for our live TV events and our uh, pay-per-view events. And we've got something really great happening. It's been the best year, in my opinion, in the history of AEW because you've got not only have we been able to launch new events with All In being the biggest thing we've ever done, setting the attendance record for ticket sales and also uh, – being up there with our top pay-per-views of all time in sales. And now with Wrestle Dream, I really think uh, this is a chance to add another new event to the calendar. Uh, I think we can continue adding great events, but I've never said I would put them every single month. I think there's a potential for more events. And what the cadence is, whether it's monthly or, you know, uh, 8, 10, 11, or, or 12, I don't, I haven't, decided the exact number yet, but I do think there's an appetite for more events. Warner Brothers Discovery is really excited about doing more events. And right now, these are living on pay-per-view, but I do think there's great potential for all of our events uh, to live uh, on a streaming service. And right now, I mean, the, the top choice for that, to me, would be Max. I think uh, it's an amazing platform, and we're working with Warner Brothers Discovery now, and I think there is great mutual interest in it, but uh, like with all media deals where there's mutual interest, there's a lot of work that would need to go into it to figure out uh, how that would uh, pay everybody because I have no interest in doing like a tryout, you know, at this point. We've been doing this for three and a half years. I'm not going to do a, a six-month, nine-month tryout on streaming. I don't think that makes any sense for any of us. So, uh, you know, I think we built it to the point where uh, there's a really, really big fan base for our major events. As we've shown this year, it's bigger than ever worldwide. And uh, I think Wrestle Dream is a huge pay-per-view event, and it doesn't necessarily signify the beginning of a monthly pay-per-view calendar, but it is a new event that we've never done, and it's something very special. And I'm just really excited to be here to talk about it today because I really believe in what we're doing with Wrestle Dream this Sunday, uh, that it's going to be an amazing event, and I'm very proud uh, that we're honoring one of the people who made AEW possible who does not get enough credit in the world of pro wrestling who doesn't get talked about enough despite being one of the greatest promoters and I think pretty much unanimously recognized as one of the all-time great wrestling minds and promoters uh, in Mr. Antonio Inoki and I'm thrilled that his family wants to participate in the event and help us honor a great legend. So uh, very excited about the event. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Stu Myrick from Sports Guys Talking Wrestling is next. He will be followed by Sean Ross Sapp from Fightful. Too. Tony, thanks for the time. Uh, there were reports that Adam Cole may have sustained a leg injury last week during Grand Slam. Can you speak to that and his status regarding the Ring of Honor tag title match with him and MJF against Aussie Open? Well, I think it's uh, you might be mistaken, too. Aussie Open, they wrestled. Uh, that's who they beat for the belt in England. They've got a, a match against the Righteous uh, this weekend. Um, the, so, uh, the match against the Aussie Open, I can comment on. It was great, and it was part of the greatest event we've ever done, but that was obviously back in August. Um, so uh, the um, the Righteous match, as of now, that is still uh, slotted for the event, and uh, Adam Cole uh, didn't, uh, you know, uh, he was a little bit uh, ginger on that leg. Obviously, I think people saw, but we'll address that on Dynamite tomorrow. And uh, very excited for tomorrow's Dynamite being back uh, in the Denver area, in, uh, in back in Colorado, back in Broomfield, which has been a great home to AEW. We've had some great events there and uh, should be a great show tomorrow night on Wednesday Night Dynamite. And we'll address uh, Adam Cole and uh, everything happening at Russell Dream on tomorrow night's 
Dynamite. Thanks, Stu. Thank you, Stu. Sean Rossap from Fightful is next. Sean will be followed by Jim Barcelone at the Miami Herald. Sean. Hey, Tony, there were some very random rumors that actually emerged on, I don't even know where the hell they emerged from, that you had bought New Japan. Is there anything that you can confirm, deny, debunk, anything uh, along the lines of that? I think a lot of that started with the end of an era, start of a new era comments. Well, I, I'm, I think it's really good that we've created a lot of speculation around Wrestle Dream, but I'm a little surprised as to how... Uh, that speculation picked up and in, in specifically uh, the transactional nature of it because we have such a great partnership right now and we're doing such great things with New Japan Pro Wrestling. So I was a little, I was a little surprised to see that. Um, and overall, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed working with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, it's been nearly two years we've been partners now and we've had two great Forbidden Door events and we've sent a number of the top AEW stars over to Japan to wrestle at the Tokyo Dome on Wrestle Kingdom and other big events like Dominion and some of their top shows. We've worked together here in the U.S. Uh, there are people from AEW that have held belts in New Japan, and there's people from New Japan that have held belts here in AEW or in Ring of Honor. And I think, uh, you know, I want to continue that partnership for a very, very, very long time. And right now we have something very good going. Um, so I, I'm a little surprised by all that speculation. I don't know where it came from exactly, but it's probably good timing to have a lot of speculation on the eve of Russell Dream. And I'm glad that we got a lot of people talking. Uh, certainly that that one video with all the great clips of Mr. Anoki and some of the top stars of today spliced in. I thought that got people talking, so that was a very positive thing. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Jim Barcelone from the Miami Herald is next. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy will follow Jim. Jim. Jim, you need to unmute your line. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim, Tony, everybody. I'm curious with Wrestle Dream and the location, it's in Seattle. I'm just curious, were there thoughts of even holding this in Japan with the great Antonio Inoki, his legacy and all there, um, or in the future maybe even hold it in Japan, or no, wanted to make this in America? I thought this was a great event for the American fans to pay their tribute to Antonio Inoki. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I wore out a shirt. There, like basically I had like three shirts when I was like 13 years old that I was in a rotation pretty much. I had a Taz shirt a Darth Vader shirt, and a Wrestling Peace Festival shirt. And uh, I wore that Peace Festival shirt celebrating Antonio Inoki's event in Los Angeles all the time. It was a white shirt, and it had the card on the back, and I wore it so much. And uh, it was a really cool thing to have wrestlers from companies all over the world coming together. And WCW was a big part of it at the time. And I think they were instrumental in making that event possible and, and having a lot of the top stars that were on the billing. And uh, it just seemed to me now the wrestling world has changed, but there are players that have come into the space, and there are some of the same players that existed 25, 30 years ago. And I just thought now that Mr. Inoki's passed away, in particular October 1st, because this is the one-year anniversary of uh, his passing, I thought it would be something really special. I remember I was in a hotel room working on AEW on the road when I heard that Antonio Inoki had passed away, and I filed the date away. And uh, I thought it would be really a great thing on October 1st to look for a venue, and Seattle is really ideal because there are wrestlers coming from Japan, and that's... Uh, well, relatively compared to a lot of the places we could have held the event in North America, that's probably a shorter flight for them than other places. Uh, so I think there's positive things about it there. Uh, so Seattle seemed like a perfect venue in America to celebrate a wrestling promoter who, yeah, most of the business he did was in Japan, but he conducted business worldwide and he did a ton of business in America. And he's also one of the reasons that 
strong style pro wrestling, junior heavyweights, and a lot of the great international pro wrestlers we saw on American television when a lot of us were kids, he's the one who brought them here. And uh, so I thought it was very fitting to celebrate the event in America as part of the AEW schedule and build something that I think can be an annual event and hopefully celebrate him every year because Anoki really deserves that. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Amy Nebedy from Russell Joy comes next, uh, followed by Bill Pritchard from Russell Zone. Amy. Hi, Tony. I wanted to talk a bit about Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr., two of the best technical wrestlers in the world. This is a match that puts the dream in Wrestle Dream. <laughs> so they haven't faced each other, though, in nearly 15 years. Brian beat Zack back in 2008, and Zack returned the favor later in 2009. Zack Sabre Jr. has dubbed this match, quote-unquote, submissions in Seattle, and vows to, quote, end Brian's career in his pursuit of truly becoming the best technical wrestler in the world. Can you talk about the stakes of this match, as well as the significance of seeing the likes of Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. face each other in such a high-profile match at Wrestle Dream? Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I'm very excited for the match. Uh, submissions, <laughs> submissions in Seattle, that's a hell of a name for this event and a hell of a name for this big match. It is definitely, in my opinion, a dream match. There was tons of anticipation. There was worldwide buzz around last year's Forbidden Door. And one of the matches we were planning to have at the event was Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr. And there was a lot of people clamoring for that match. As you said, they have not wrestled in well over a decade. And it's amazing how far both of them have come since then. I mean, both of them have just uh, not only... Uh, in their careers, certainly they've accomplished a lot, but also physically they've really built their bodies up. These are different wrestlers than they were when they wrestled uh, 15 years ago. And Brian Danielson, one of the biggest stars on the entire planet, one of the most recognizable pro wrestlers in the world. I think Brian Danielson, certainly one of the most important people in AEW, and then he's facing off against Zack Sabre Jr., certainly one of the most important people in New Japan pro wrestling. And they both possess uh, a mastery of grappling. They both have, I think, I, I, I think they both have got probably uh, the most complete skill set of any technical wrestler. And I think the fans would agree with that. And that's why uh, when the fans have voted for the best technical wrestler, it's almost always going to be Brian Danielson or Zack Sabre Jr. for the last 15 years, I would, I would say. And it's a dream come true to have that match on pay-per-view. It was something I, I wanted to be able to present at the original Forbidden Door, and Brian uh, got a concussion in the original Anarchy in the Arena in Vegas and was not able to participate on the inaugural Forbidden Door. That's one of the reasons it meant so much to have that match, that great main event with Brian and Okada this year, which was, you know, doing something special uh, at Forbidden Door. But there was another match from the original Forbidden Door that I'd really, really been clamoring for or wanting to have. And that was uh, Danielson versus Sabre. I think it's going to be great. And I'm, I love the name that Zach gave it, Submissions in Seattle, for this Sunday. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amy. Bill Pritchard from the Wrestle Zone, you're next. John Powell from Slam Wrestling will follow Bill. You're up, Bill. Hey, Tony. How are you? I'm good, Bill. Thanks, man. So I wanted to go back to the end of an era comment and the buying a promotion rumor. I know that was probably the most prominent one, but would you go as far as saying you are not doing that? You would deny that that is credible or maybe care to eliminate any of the other rumors or clarify like what you actually meant by those comments? I definitely have no intention of clarifying what I meant by those comments. I want people to order the pay-per-view, <laughs> but, but I, uh, I definitely uh, also never speculated that, uh, you know, I think, I think the internet kind of ran away with the speculation based on, I don't know what, honestly, I'd love for somebody to go back and look who the first person to say that was. And, and and we're in track back where the speculation came from because certainly I don't know if that that particular aspect of it is very credible 
you know, there's dots you can connect in wrestling and there's things I'm very excited about that we've been doing. And I think I've taken, I've, I've made bold proclamations before and I felt that uh, I've been proven right by them. I think we've come a really long way. We've taken big swings at, at doing new things this year. And in particular, uh, I think 2023 has been our most adventurous year. And I want to keep doing adventurous things and make it fans talk about AEW, hopefully making new fans of AEW. One thing, I, I think we've debunked a lot of, debunked some speculation. I'd be happy to debunk this speculation uh, that, you know, that's, uh, what I'm uh, uh, was implying because I don't know where that particular rumors got started, but I think this year we've also really built our reputation in a really strong way. Uh, there's, there's, but we've gotten to the point where they're basically like town criers. Like if somebody's going to tell you AEW doesn't do good shows, you might as well put a tinfoil hat. Because that's got about as much credibility as somebody saying that AEW is not doing the best shows right now. If you're not watching, that's fine. You can say you're not watching them. But to question the credibility of how they are, it's BS. Because we're doing the best shows. I think from Forbidden Door to All In to All Out, I think Grand Slam was a great event. And uh, the Collision this week was probably the best episode of Collision we've ever done in the first 15 episodes of the show so far. So we're doing great things. People would say AEW doesn't tell stories. Okay, well, again, show me... Uh, that you don't watch the product because nobody's telling more stories in pro wrestling right now than AEW. And I'm really excited about some of the stories we're telling. And something I'm very proud of is when our back's against the wall, we do great work here as a company. There's a lot of really hardworking people here. And unfortunately, over the years, we've had to change things due to injury or other circumstance. And I'm, I think we've always shown, whether it was injury or something, uh, at times even tragic circumstances, we really roll with the punches and put great shows on. Uh, and right now, I feel like we've never been more organized. There have been some challenges and continue to be some things that pop up along the way, but the quality of the show has never been stronger, and that's, that look, it happens in football, too. You have players get injured, and nobody has it. You, you have to go out and play the next play. You have to go out and play uh, the next quarter, the next half, the next game, and the rest of the season, sometimes without these players, and, uh, you know, you have to, you have a game plan. Nobody feels bad for you that your game plan got knocked off script because some of the players got knocked out of the game. You just have to keep going with whatever script you can put together. And I think that's true whether it's in football or wrestling. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy with what we're doing right now. So without uh, completely uh, spilling the beans on everything I'm working on or, or everything I see for the future, I do think uh, it is really – uh, going to be the start of a, a new era of what we're doing with AEW, and I'm very excited about that. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Uh, John Powell from Slam Wrestling has a writing question, which I'll read in a minute, and then I'll ask Dave Meltzer <clears throat> from the Wrestling Observer to uh, follow this this writing here, Tony. What are your thoughts on Eddie Kingston versus Tatsuyori Shibata? On many levels, this is a dream match between two of the toughest in the business. What a great match. What a great match. Uh, so this is one of those dream matches I'm so happy to be able to put on. I've tried to link these two in wrestling, especially in 2023. I think they've taken very different paths to get where they are, but they both hold championships in Ring of Honor. They've both been great champions in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Right now, Eddie Kingston's a double champion. And we've seen these two team, you know, they've, they've had great tag team matches. Um, we saw these two stand in tall at the end of Supercard of Honor and even teaming at All Out, which was something I was really excited about. And I believe these two, uh, while they come from very different backgrounds, while they look very different, if you saw them, they'd, they'd be like a buddy cop movie with nothing in common. but Really, they have a lot of similarities, and I have a bond with each of them that's, that's different, but again, there's similarities in it, and these are 
two pro wrestlers who love the sport so much. And they prove it every time they go out there. I don't think anybody's ever questioned Eddie Kingston's love for wrestling. And I think it's one of his great skills and gifts is that he presents himself with this authenticity and this intensity. And he goes out and nobody ever questions when he's out there that this guy loves what he's doing. This guy loves wrestling and this guy is intense. He hates certain opponents. He hates uh, disrespect wrestling. And this guy takes no nonsense. And I think Shibata project, projects that himself in a different way. But uh, it's not as verbal, but it is just as impactful. And I think uh, Shibata's presence in pro wrestling shows how much he loves wrestling. And one of my favorite quotes ever in the sport was when we uh, – had the press conference earlier this year and he said, you know, I'm not out here wrestling to die. I'm here wrestling to live. I feel alive doing this. And in particular in, in recent months, more so than ever, he feels more connected, uh, to his craft, to the sport, to the fans than he ever has. I think it means a lot to Shibata to come to America and do, Top tier American sport. I'm going to be in these venues uh, to be fighting. Be uh, in America. It's like a, it's a dream of his, and he's really having fun with it. Like Shibata has become a massive leader in a lot of. Room. He's become a great part of our crew because he spent most of the year with us here in the deep in ROH. And along with uh, a handful of other leaders, and Shabbat is one of our uh, generals backstage. And I think this match, the dream come true. You know, I know there's fans all over the world who love pro wrestling that I've seen say that this is a dream for them too. And I think with Ingram also with fans like to see and uh, what people care about in their pro wrestling. I think this is a match people really wanted to see and we've danced around it and we've been up the together and that time we see some one on one and that beating now is a huge win, a double champion. This could be a, a double title match and Shibata has a chance to create a new triple crown in international pro wrestling, which I thought is really exciting too. Jim, you got the next one? Yeah, you know, Tony, we're, we're, uh, we're having a little bit of connectivity problems there with you. So uh, we'll um, uh, maybe just check on your end to make sure you're all clean. And, and we're going to continue here uh, with Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer. And following Dave will be Liam Crowley from comicbook.com. Let's give it a shot. Dave? Um, Tony, how you doing? I'm great, Dave. Thanks. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. I hope you're doing well, too. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just going to ask you, I mean, one of the big questions and one of the big rumors going around has to do with the ownership of the company and WBD. And is there any negotiations going on or anything to, uh, do they own a minority piece or is there any negotiations going on in that direction? Uh, well, it's something we talked about a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations about, uh, about that. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it's always been something I've been open to. Uh, and, you know, between uh, Warner Brothers Discovery and myself, a lot of the financial and structural details of our partnership we've been able to uh, keep between us. But uh, there are things I've always said to be true, I, that I own 100% of the voting stock in this company uh, and that I have 100% of the decision-making power in the company. Um, and I've been open uh, to taking on additional partnerships or things of that nature, but we have a, a really great deal uh, right now uh, with Warner Brothers Discovery, and uh, and I would love to uh, have an, uh, an even longer agreement. And uh, as for um, them and, and their stake in the business, I mean, uh, that is something that would be between us, uh, but I would also be open to that, to Warner Brothers uh, in, a, in a future deal, having a piece or a bigger 
piece potentially, uh, but I would always want to maintain 100% voting control as I have now and uh, want to maintain, uh, you know, the super majority uh, of stock, which I have now. So I think uh, these are things that are really important to me. Uh, but in a future deal, I mean, these are things, you know, I would be open to. It's not, there's nothing bad about it. I mean, we've seen in pro wrestling this year uh, a change of control. I have no interest in a change of control. Um, would I be interested in taking on additional investment? Yeah, potentially, but um, it would have to be at the right numbers and it would have to make sense for us based on how much our business has grown this year. Uh, but as for a change of control or giving up any of the voting stock, no, I have no interest in that. Okay. And um, okay. Thank you very much. Is that a part? Is that a two-parter, Dave? Oh well, I mean, I know. I mean, the only other question I had was uh, was, was was regarding Wardlow. You know, if there's anything new on his front. Sure, that's a fair question. Uh, well, Wardlow is a great star for us. I think uh, he's been one of the greatest TNT champions we've had. He's been a great star, and I'm I'm a very big fan of Wardlow, and I think that he will surely be back uh, on AEW TV when the time is right. And he's still very much a part of uh, what we're doing here. Thank Thanks, Jake. Jack. Liam Crowley from comicbook.com is next, followed by Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT. Liam. Hey, Tony. Thanks for the time today. Uh, you had a really great response around this time last year where everything that transpired with All Out uh, and what you learned as a backstage leader leading a wrestling promotion uh, after such a tumultuous event and coming out stronger as a result. Uh, AEW currently at the end of this month looks a lot different than it did uh, at the beginning of September, and I would say stronger. So uh, what are some lessons that you feel like you've learned from a leadership perspective uh, through everything that's transpired uh, over the summer with both your tremendous successes with All In and some of the other low points during this during the summer? Well, it's been a great summer for us. I think, you know, I'm really, really, really very excited about everything we've done. Uh, it's a challenge running a wrestling company. I mean, look, it's a lot easier on paper than it is in real life. Uh, and uh, it's really fun. And it's, it's a dream come true for me. But it's also uh, uh, around the clock work. And I love I just, I, it's so great working in pro wrestling. It's a, it's really what I've always wanted to do and to get into the business and connect with so many great people. Uh, you know, you're right. The company does look very different than it did, uh, say a year ago or two years ago. And I think it's, you know, a good thing, uh, just as sports teams change season to season, you try to find their footing and, and then find that team that comes together and has that that perfect season or that great season uh it feels like one of those really great memorable seasons for us right now and there have been a lot of changes but everybody who's working on the shows right now is doing a great job uh it's been a great week for us in particular you know to have grand slam be the biggest audience we've reached all year and do the biggest number in the demo we've done in over a year and outperform last year's Grand Slam, despite, oh, you know, uh, frankly, there's not as many people with cable subscriptions as there were when we did Grand Slam last year, particularly in the 18 to 49 demo, but we actually had more viewers this year. I think that's great progress. And it was also a great event. So I was really proud of that. And then to have uh, Collision this week do a really strong number and I think be the single best episode in ring. That's the best thing. And I've always loved when we do things that are both critically and commercially successful. And I think stepping back and, and putting the wrestling product first is the most important thing. You know, we can't sign every wrestler. We can't keep every single wrestler, but we can do our best to make sure the shows that we put together are the best shows for the AEW fans every week and, and try to utilize everyone the best we can. I think uh, it's, Really, I, first of all, the statement I made about a year ago that was a good statement, I, I don't remember that. So if I made a good statement, I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm not sure which one you mean. So, I, uh, but I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, there's no weeks off. It's great. There's no weeks off from being a wrestling fan, too. And I think 
all of us have probably had that point in our lives as a wrestling fan where you're watching 52 weeks a year and, you know, it's like, hey, my family and I got to take a vacation or we got to, um, you know, uh, you're getting married. I got to go away from rock and wrestling for a couple of weeks or, or whatever it is. And, or especially when you're younger and, you know, if you're playing sports and traveling with your teams, uh, or in college, like where, you know, your life totally changes and it goes, uh, you know, you're on your own and you're doing something completely different from what you've been doing. Your, your TV viewing habits are very different. Maybe you have roommates. Maybe you go to college and you got roommates who don't want to watch wrestling and you grew up watching it alone at home in your room or in your living room with your family or whatever, and people in college don't want to watch it. Just things change. I get that. But at the end of the day, everybody on this call clearly came back to it. And everybody watching the shows every week, they probably at some point went through that same thing because when you have wrestling as a 52-week-a-year thing, I think we all have these unique experiences at some point that you just need to do things in your life that don't involve TV. And I, while I discourage people from doing those things, I do acknowledge that they have to do them sometimes. And uh, as much as we can keep you glued to your set and, and, and focus on what's happening in wrestling, I want to do that. But I think the real skill in what we do as wrestling promoters and, and those of us who put on weekly wrestling TV shows that have maintained an audience and that are you know on television right now, I think... What we're able to do each week is get people to commit to us, to spend their time with us, and to uh, not step away from it, to, to keep focused on it. And I think that's uh, something amazing about wrestling is that through 52 weeks a year that we're able to maintain such audience engagement because at the end of the day, so many of us are really hooked on this, like I am. Like I've never had a break that lasted more than a week or two. And maybe a, maybe a few weeks. And, you know, I've been in China, like, trying to find wrestling on TV at 8 in the morning uh, on a Monday. So I, uh, you know, I, wherever I go in the world, wherever I've been, I've had experiences uh, that have shown me that there, it, it's, Over 52 weeks a year, what we do to keep the wrestling fans engaged and also just for ourselves, like, you have to remember that as a wrestling company, there's no week off from this. So it's really exciting to go into an event like Wrestle Dream that's a new event and feel the excitement from it and feel that people are passionate about wrestling, passionate about what we're doing, because there's no guarantees to those things in life. And frankly, in this wrestling business, more people have failed than they succeeded. And the things we've done and we've accomplished, they're historic. You know, they're, it's really, really cool. And it's because of the fans that they stick with us 52 weeks a year. I really appreciate it. If somebody, uh, whether it's every week or most weeks or as much as possible, however much you watch the show, however much you buy tickets or come, I really, really appreciate it. I don't know how to articulate it any better than that. That's why I always try to come out and say thank you to the live fans at the shows or thank the fans online for watching it. That's heartfelt. I really mean it. And there's a lot of things people could be doing with their time. And there's things that change in people's lives that may make it harder to watch the shows. So when they do, I really appreciate it. So I guess that's probably the biggest thing is, look, there's like no weeks off for us from this. You know, some of the people might get a week off here and there, but, uh, you know, for me, there's no weeks off from this. And for a lot of the people, there aren't. And I think that's awesome. I love it. I wouldn't want it any other way because that's what wrestling is. Thank you. Well said, Tony. Thank you, Liam. Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT is next. And we're going to follow Samantha with a write-in question from Ella J from A Wrestling Gal. Samantha. Hi, Tony. Hi, Finn. Uh, I have a question for you. So we saw last week with Grand Slam, Eddie Kingston and the Elite both winning ROH titles, and then we've seen Better, Better Than You Baby also winning titles. Can we expect to see them more on uh, ROH programming, and is there going to be any clear brand separation between the two companies, as you had previously mentioned, or is it kind of going to be what we've been seeing where there's uh, with wrestlers going back and forth between the two? 
Well, it's a great question. I think right now Ring of Honor has got an incredibly strong lineup of champions. I think we had one going into Grand Slam, and now uh, it's still very true, but certainly um, even more added star power now with the Hung Bucks as six-man champs with Hangman Page and the Young Bucks. And they had been the six-man champs of ROH in the past. I think it's amazing uh, that they hold those belts again. That's three of the top stars in wrestling, and it's great for ROH. I mean, uh, when you look at the, the – the roster of champions in ROH right now and compare it to a few years ago, there's no question ROH is, in my opinion, the strongest it's ever been. And certainly it's night and day from where it was, say, three, four years ago. And uh, as for the ROH shows, I really enjoy them. I think we've had some really great wrestling. There's really fun things happening on the shows week to week. If you don't have a subscription to watch ROH.com, there's weekly shows on there that we put on Thursdays. It's really fun wrestling TV. We're having a great time with it. And you are going to see more of those uh, top stars now that they've won titles competing on that show. So, yes, you will see that. And also there's great things with people who have held titles for a while now on the show. I mean, you know, Shibata has wrestled many times on the show. Just had a great match with Nick Wayne last week. Uh, Shibata, one of the greatest champions in all of wrestling, in my opinion, wrestling's greatest champion is Shibata. And... Uh, and then to have Athena, who is, in my opinion, doing some of the best work in wrestling today, and the Athena-Billy Starks pairing, we're having a lot of fun with that. I really enjoy working with the both of them. Uh, Athena is a great veteran. Billy is very young, but is wise beyond her years, and uh, they have great chemistry, and we're having a lot of fun with that story. And uh, just a lot of really exciting things happening in ROH, and certainly now that We've leveled up in some ways uh, uh, from when we began, but I think, you know, we've consistently had great champions recently in ROH. And I have, you know, with Eddie Kingston uh, winning the title, with Adam Page, Hangman, and the Young Bucks winning the, the six-man belt, I have to talk about the great champions that held those titles. Claudio Castagnoli is one of the best wrestlers in the world, and him coming in and taking that ROH world title, he's defended it on the ROH TV and pay-per-views, defended it, uh, on AEW, he's been a great champion, and he is one of the best wrestlers in the world, and we were very fortunate to have Claudio as the ROH champion, and any time he wrestles in AEW or ROH, I feel like we're very fortunate to have him. I never take Claudio for granted. And also, I, I have to talk about the ROH six-man tag team champion, uh, Mogul Embassy, with Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony. They're the longest reigning six-man champs of all time. They were dominant. They wrestled on the uh, ROH TV pay-per-views, defended the titles on all different shows, and I really thought they came so far. I mean, the Gates of Agony, like when we first put them together, they'd never teamed. And it was like we were sitting together before the first Supercard, and it was like, okay, let's go over ideas for team names, <laughs> and let's talk about what the finisher is going to be, and like all these things, and to think about, how far they've come from that first show, uh, it's amazing. You know, they won uh, the six-man belts early on, and uh, I made a switch. Originally, uh, they were managed by Tully Blanchard, and uh, Tully didn't didn't come to death before the honor, uh, which is which is okay. But but you can't really that would that would be the end of our uh, our run together. But but you know, I, I wish him the best. But it also created a great opportunity. And Prince Nana has seized that opportunity. And I'm very excited about Prince Nana's career in wrestling. He was a great manager of Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony. He still is a great manager for them, but I think they've been great champions. He's a great championship manager. And he can manage them as champions in the future or Swerve Strickland. That's a great group. And, uh, you know, we talked about Hangman. Uh, I think it adds a little bit more fuel to the fire for Hangman versus Swerve this weekend. Swerve's guys. They were the longest reigning six-man champs ever in ROH. And I felt like Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony had become synonymous with those belts, truly, and had made so many great defenses, had so many great matches. And uh, now Hangman and the Young Bucks taking those belts away from Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony, I think uh, that's more fuel to the fire for this Sunday, Swerve versus Hangman on pay-per-view at Wrestle Dream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha.
Tony, I've got a write-in question here from Ella J. I'm going to read in a second. Then I'm going to ask Dominic D'Angelo from Inside the Ropes to be ready after Tony answers Ella, who asks, Julia Hart has evolved tremendously since arriving to AEW. What are your thoughts on her evolution and now positioning herself as a challenger to the TBS championship? Well, it's really exciting. I think Julia is somebody that's been with us since daily plays. It's crazy to think about how young Julia is, uh, that she's another wrestler that's been with us since she was a teenager. And it's amazing how many great stars for AEW developed out of that Daily's Place era. It's something to think about. Uh, you know, we found something that really worked very well there for us. And uh, in the back of my mind, Daily's Place is always there. It's a great venue, and it's worked tremendously well for us. We've shown that we can create a great developmental system out of there and produce great talent and help people that are, have all the potential in the world to realize that potential in AEW. And we've seen that from top stars like the Acclaimed, I think are really an amazing example of that. Powerhouse Hobbs and Julia Hart are great examples of people that were with us uh, in really wrestling uh, on AEW Dark, Dark and wrestling on the different shows through the pandemic and then came out so much better than they came in in terms of their development. And Julia Hart in particular has just been on fire and she's just such a pleasure to work with. Julia Hart works really hard. She always shows up. Uh, she has great ideas. She's very, very gifted athlete. And it's amazing how far it has come because I remember when we started working with Julia Hart as a teenager and it was her idea she said, you know, I'd be a great cheerleader for the Varsity Blondes. And I thought, oh, okay, that could be cool. And, and she went out and did a great job with it. And she worked really hard at it. And then when this presented itself organically, this opportunity for her to go with the House of Black, she ran with it. And she has uh, done so much. And I've tried to put her in prominent, strong positions. It's been a really long time since anybody beat Julia in a wrestling match. Julia has gone about a year and a half undefeated. And uh, through these matches, I think 26 now, we're, you know, she's dominated her competition. She's got a big match tomorrow night on Dynamite. And if she makes it through that in one piece, she's challenging for the TBS title this weekend against Chris Statlander. And Chris Statlander is actually the last person to beat Julia Hart in a match, which is crazy to think. Uh, but Julia has been on this crazy run for so long. And look at the video of the last time Julia lost the match to Statlander. And Julia was in the middle of a major transition in her persona. Uh, you know, she had, she was still the cheerleader, but she was wearing the eye patch. And uh, it was the start of the next phase of, of Julia's career. And what she's become is a top star. And it's really exciting to see. I love working with Julia. And I think she is somebody that could be a great TBS champion. And she's facing somebody that uh, has also really developed in AEW since the company started and grown into her spot. I think it's a great match for Wrestle Dream, Statlander versus Julia Hart. And I'm very excited for that one on Sunday in Seattle. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Dominic D'Angelo from Inside the Ropes, you're next. He will be followed by Mark Hoke from the Mark Hoke Show, 101.5 KDON FM. Tony, Dominic. how are you today? Very well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, um, so I uh, kind of thought, uh, I think it's pretty cool that you're getting to honor Antonio Inoki and everything like that with Wrestle Dream. Something else you've been kind of doing uh, in an indirect way of honoring people are the ECW guys, obviously. Uh, RVD, uh, I host podcasts with them. Kind of wanted to get your experience of having RVD there. He's been getting very good reactions. Uh, is there an incentive to have him more uh, appear more with AEW? And following up real quick to uh, Arthur Ashe Stadium, New York City. Uh, ECW has a history there as well. Is there any interest ever in doing the Hammerstein Ballroom there as well? Interesting question. Uh, well, I, it's no secret I grew up as a fan of ECW. Uh, some of the great stars in ECW have worked here with us. And, of course, Taz works with us every week. And his son, Hook, 
is a big part of AEW. I think you've probably all heard this story in the past, but if you haven't, um, bear with me for 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, my dad was backstage at the first ever Grand Slam show uh, two years ago, just over two years ago, and he went up to Hook, and he said, your dad's a really tough guy. Like, I took my son to ECW when I was a kid, and to see what those guys went through, your, your dad's got to be a really tough guy. you got to be proud of your dad. And uh, I thought that was really cool. And now, fast forward to two years later, I think, of course, Hook very proud of Taz, but I know Taz should be very proud of Hook because Hook has come a long way in these past couple years. Uh, similar to what we were just talking about with Julia, right, where they were both so young when they started with us in Daly's Place, and they've both developed and gone on these great runs where they've had great records, and both of them have shown they could be, I believe, great champions in AEW. And Hook uh, is one of our really bright young prospects and is becoming a really popular star in arenas all over the world. And I thought RVD would be a great, uh, a great uh, partner for him, a great a foil in uh, Hook's previous story, and then now a great partner for Hook himself. And they had a really fun match. The Collision episode did a great rating. It's one of, one of a really great rating success stories on Collision going against some of the toughest competition and you're ever going to see. Uh, I, in particular, I believe NBC said that the Notre Dame-Ohio State football game was their highest rated uh, Saturday football telecast for college football since 1993. So we were up against some of the toughest fo- college football competition in 30 years, literally and put up an amazing number. So it's awesome to see there was a great audience for Collision this week. I think we're doing really great stuff with the show, and that was really encouraging to see uh, a great show get a great number like that on Saturday. And RVD was a great part of it. You know, the, the Michigan fans were very excited to see him. He got a great reaction in the live arena, and the show did a great rating. And I think he's been here on a case-by-case, show-by-show basis, but... We love we having him, and I would certainly be very, very uh, open to Rob returning in the very near future. As, as we said when I saw him this past weekend, uh, he's doing a great job, and we'd love to have him back. So great to have Rob here anytime he's available to do it and anytime it makes sense for everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Mark Hoke from the Mark Hoke Show 101.5 KDON FM is next to be followed by Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. Mark. Hi, Tony. Good to talk to you again. You um, Thanks, man. Yep. Uh, question about MJF. Uh, there have been a lot of talk over the past couple of years about positioning MJF as a face as opposed to being a heel. And now with what's happened with the better than Bebe phenomenon, phenomenon taking off, what presentation position do you guys see MJF holding moving forward? Well, MJF is, as it stands right now, one of the, I mean, certainly it's been a transitional period, but um, we've seen MJF's one of the true fan favorites right now. I don't think it's changed uh, who he is at his core necessarily, but as he said, you know, he may be a scumbag, but now he's our scumbag. And I think that's probably the best characterization we could give. I think it's a very apt description of it. He's our scumbag. He's, uh, the MJF we, we've always known and loved to hate, but now we don't really have to hate him so much anymore because he's our scumbag. And I think that's something that's really been embraced by the fans, and it's shown because uh, Better Than You, Bebe, have sold an ungodly amount of merchandise, and they continue uh, to rack up that merch money for us, which is awesome. And uh, they get these massive reactions, and I think it's awesome. It's befitting of a top star, and in this case, of a fan favorite. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, <clears throat> Mark. Appreciate that. Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics is next, and we will conclude with Nick Tilwalk from USA Today's Wrestling Junkie. Brandon. Hey, Brandon. Brandon, you need to unmute your line. Hi, Tony. Thanks for the time. 
Hey, Brandon, my with, pleasure. With, with, with the news that Fox is not renewing SmackDown, uh, do you see Fox as a potential bidder for AEW rights? I don't think it would be fair uh, to talk about possible bidders or outside speculation. Right now, we're on Warner Brothers Discovery, and you know, I find that in uh, the entertainment business, there's not a lot of loyalty at times, and there should be. And this is a family business. We're not a public company. Um, I'm not, you know, even even if I get punched in the face. Uh, with circumstances, it doesn't mean that I'm going to take it out on the staff by cutting 100 staff or laying off 30 wrestlers. And I really care about the people here. And I would, you know, I, I would do anything I can uh, to protect the jobs and the livelihood of the people that work here. And that's a family business. And that's the difference between a family business and a public company in a lot of ways. And not, and not every family business has those principles, but we do. And that's just how I was raised. And uh, I have to say that I feel like there's not enough loyalty in the entertainment business where, yes, it, it's no secret and it, and it is a business. So we'll be up at, you know, at the end of 2024. And I would love to stay at Warner Brothers Discovery forever. I think it's, it's great for the fans to have wrestling on TBS and TNT. I do think there will be a lot of potential bidders. I think that what you just said would make, probably make a lot of sense, you know, in the future. But I don't. I also don't think it's uh, right for me to speculate right now because I'm at Warner Brothers Discovery. I love it here. We're going to be here for for a while and hopefully a really long time. And they've given us these great opportunities, and I and I see it all the time. And sometimes I'm uh, on the other side of it as. Uh, as the promoter, uh, you know, on the other side of the negotiating table and not, you know, not being the talent as I, as I probably am in this case with one of sitting on the other side of a negotiation. And I really appreciate everything they've done for me and it, and it would not be right for me to speculate about other networks or other people, uh, in the wrestling business, uh, Certainly, I have a great relationship with the, the, the people you named because we work together on the NFL, and uh, that's, a, that's a great place for sports and a great place for wrestling. But for me, I'm really happy at Warner Brothers Discovery, and uh, my goal, the all things being equal, would be to keep AEW here forever at, at WBD. Uh, Mr. Zasloff has been really kind to me and given me great opportunities, and uh, if all things being equal or even if uh, it was a couple cents difference. Uh, you know, I would, I would probably even take a, a penny or two less to stay at Warner Brothers Discovery, which you don't see that in uh, media businesses very much and that kind of loyalty. So I really, uh, really appreciate everything they've done for me. And, uh, you know, and, and they continue to do. And tomorrow we have a big dynamite on TBS. We're coming off our best performance of the year. They were very kind to send out a press release highlighting uh, how well Grand Slam performed last week touting that it was the most watched episode of the year and you know i really appreciated that and i think if we can do things to make them proud then they're going to stand behind us and we'll get the kind of offer that uh will surely uh make us you know i think uh, uh you know the, the kind of offer that surely would be befitting of the kind of great performances we've had and uh I'm just very happy at, at WBD right now, and I cannot say enough good stuff about Mr. Zasloff and the opportunities he's given us, especially since we launched Collision. And uh, I think the company is really stronger than ever since we launched Collision, because if you look, I think it's allowed us to tell more stories. You know, we have, in my opinion, the best roster in pro wrestling. I think we have great talent. There's a lot of great wrestlers in the world, and not all the great wrestlers are in AEW, but I think we have more of the greats than anyone else does, in my personal opinion. And it's hard to feature all the great stars and develop the young stars for the future and tell all the stories you want to tell in three hours of television. And when you have nine or ten matches on a big pay-per-view, and when you're doing the best pay-per-views in wrestling and you want to build the matches up, it's hard to do that in three hours. I did the best I could for a really long time. And I was at a point personally where I was getting really frustrated having to try and do it all in three hours. So the timing of Mr. Zasloff coming in and saying, hey, why don't we give you another two hours? Let's put a deal together. 
for Saturday nights, 8 p.m., and you come up with a creative plan and what you want it to be, and that plan is collision. And whether it's the elements that I've, I've tried to add to spice it up, like some different presentation versus dynamite or buying the rights to Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, uh, licensing those from Elton John and, and his great group. I think uh, we've tried to do things to show that we really appreciate this opportunity and I'm going to take it really seriously. If you're going to give us another two hours, we'll do everything we can to make it a great show and make it not not a copy of Dynamite, very different from Dynamite, but also uh, just as strong of an event every week. And where we'll have now five hours of television and two real two-hour flagship shows to, to put out there for licensing deals going forward for worldwide distribution. And uh, I think none of that would have been possible without Warner Brothers Discovery. And what it's afforded us now is the ability with five hours of television to, to do more great matches on TV every week, build more stories. Since the launch of Collision, it's been, in my opinion, the best AEW ever. I don't think we've ever had as good of a streak of pay-per-views as the one we're on since Collision launched, which is Forbidden Door, All In and All Out. And if we keep doing these great events, uh, you know, I, I, the momentum's only going to continue to build. And I, I really am very appreciative for the launch of Collision. Now we're going into Wrestle Dream, and I think it wouldn't have been possible, you know, in this past month to build Wrestle Dream up and make it feel like such a major event without Collision. I think Collision's been a huge part of that. And this week, again, this Saturday was a great show and I think built more anticipation to Wrestle Dream coming up this Sunday. And I think the launch of Collision has made us a stronger, better company than we've ever been. Uh, so, again, I'm just really grateful to WBD for all the opportunities and I just want to put them over right now because I think uh, rather than talk about other people or other other companies that are out there, other media companies, that's pretty ungrateful for me to do, given everything they've done for me. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> Tony, we, uh, we, we, uh, we mentioned that uh, Nick Tilwalk from USA Today's Wrestling Junkie would conclude. Do we have time to, to take care of uh, Nick here? Tony, you there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're cutting out there, but let, let's try to get a quick question and a quick answer in from Nick Tilwalk from USA Today's Wrestling Junkie. Nick? Yeah, hey, Tony. Thank you for taking the time for this. Uh, the Righteous is obviously a uh, talented tag team with some great presentation, but I think they might not be as familiar to fans who haven't been watching Ring of Honor. What have you seen from them as a team that uh, gives you the comfort level to put them on such a high-profile show against two of the top stars in AEW? I have been really impressed with them since they came into ROH, and that's why I've tried to feature them more recently in AEW. I think it would be either company. Uh, they have experience in history with ROH, which is why I thought this in particular could be a good way to bring them back into the fold, but then they've done so well on the ROH events that it led to us utilizing them at times in AEW, and in recent weeks, we've been featuring them more regularly. They've had some matches, uh, been involved on Rampage, been involved on Collision, had a, had a really strong match with the Hardys and a dominant win, and uh, in addition to their wrestling, I think they've got a lot of charisma. Their, their interviews, their videos uh, are pretty captivating, and We've had them involved a couple weeks in collision, and you know people have really uh, responded to their promos, to their match, uh, and I think having them uh, as a part of Wrestle Dream, it makes a lot of sense. It's, uh, we're bringing in stars from different companies, different promotions all over the world, and MJF and Adam Cole, the ROH Tag Team Champions, looking to defend against one of the top teams in ROH. So we had this uh, four-way match with four top teams that all have great history in ROH, including some former champions. And it was a, an excellent match that we had at the Grand Slam Rampage. And, of course, the Righteous were the winners. I think there's some great teams in that match when you look at the Hardys, the Best Friends, and the Kingdom, 
some, that have, some teams that have held the ROH World Tag Team titles in the past. And for me, uh, the Righteous, uh, they have uh, exactly what we're looking for in new stars in that they have a unique quality that differentiates them from other stars in AEW. And I can see a place for them on the roster uh, because of their charisma, their wrestling ability, and their history. And so I think, you know, them against MJF and Adam Cole, it's a great fit. And we have a really strong card top to bottom for Wrestle Dream, and I think uh, I'm excited to have the Righteous as part of the show. Okay, thank you, Nick. Tony, let's uh, close. Any, any any final thoughts before we wrap it up? I have a lot of thoughts. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm really grateful to all of you being here today to talk about Wrestle Dream and AEW. We've got a great show coming up tomorrow night in Denver, uh, Wednesday night Dynamite, it's technically in Broomfield, but, but right outside Denver. And then we're heading up to Seattle for Wrestle Dream. It's a really important week for the company. None of this would be possible without all of you. And I, I know I I know I say it pretty much every call, but I mean it, and it's important. I'm really grateful to all of you sitting through this and, and transcribing it, asking questions, and covering AEW because uh, – you know, none of what we've done would have been possible without you. When we when we started AEW, as many of you recall, because you were around, a lot of you were around, there was no TV. We were really reliant on you and your coverage and the online wrestling community to disseminate word about AEW and to help us create the buzz. And uh, I'm very very appreciative of you all. I've been I, I try to follow your commentary and your thoughts, and it feels as if the spirit around AEW feels as if uh, the vibe around AEW is incredibly positive right now. It feels like we've done a great streak of shows for you all, and that makes me really happy because, uh, you know, before I was a wrestling promoter, I was a wrestling fan, and I read your coverage. A lot of you, the people asked me questions today, were the people I turned to to learn about wrestling. And... Uh, when we do shows that you think are, are good, that makes me really proud. And, you know, I'm doing my best for the fans, and that includes all of you. And I, I've said it multiple times today, but I feel like we're on our best run since Collision started. The, the pay-per-views have gotten better, and I believe better than ever. And what we're doing this Sunday is really important. I think a lot of you on the call are historians of wrestling. And if it was another wrestling promoter, I suspect you would be questioning my motivations. Why is he doing this? Is this a cash grab? Trying, you know, things like that. But not one person has said that to me or uh, really indicated that to me, which I take a lot of pride in because, uh, look, people are very skeptical these days, and they should be. I think there's a lot of things to be skeptical about in the world, but this is not one of them. And we've had no skepticism, and I think that speaks to how pure our love of wrestling is and the fact that I think people really see that this is a good thing we're doing to honor Antonio Inoki with a great wrestling card. And sure, I'm running a wrestling show for profit here, but I also think uh, in doing so, we're honoring a great legend and doing something that will mean a lot to a lot of people. I also expect it to be one of our best wrestling shows. So I hope to see many of you in Seattle, maybe at the Scrum afterwards. If I don't see you in person, hopefully... Uh, we'll see you either in Los Angeles at full gear or somewhere on the road. Uh, but just can't thank you enough for participating in this call and, and uh, the kind words recently about what we're doing with AEW. And hopefully uh, we'll catch you all soon. Jim, thank you for moderating this. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, holding this thing together and uh, look forward to seeing you too soon. And uh, thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Yeah, thank you, Tony. <clears throat> and, and just to echo, thanks to everybody here. We are at the end of our time, so we're going to be distributing the audio recording here to everyone shortly. Um, as always, a thousand thanks uh, for, for being a part of today's call and, and just everything that Tony said. You know, we, we So we're looking forward to seeing you uh, in, in uh, Seattle this weekend and joining us throughout the entire week for a great uh, week of AAW programming. And I uh, hope to see you in Seattle, and best wishes to everybody. Best, best to you. Bye-bye.